the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of mystery with Vincent Price as your host. Here's a preview. It's a perfect plan. What can go wrong? Hey, don't try to involve me in this. You are a genius, Toby. You got the mind of a master criminal. I was just making a game. How but... much you figured the old lady's worth? Five, six million? What? We'd be set up for life. I wasn't serious. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. You said that opposites attract. Well, we won't dispute that. In fact, our story concerns two friends who at first glance seem quite unalike. Toby McVeigh is a plumber with his own small business. He does quite well. Not perhaps as well as we sometimes think plumbers do, but well enough nonetheless. He works hard, which is more than can be said for his friend, Iron Smith. Even to be kind about it, we would have to characterize Iron as no good. He is a hustler and a small-time confidence man who thinks Toby is relentlessly square. Hi, Iron. Hey, Toby. Want to go shoot some pool? I'm on my way to a job. Ah, uh, take the afternoon off. Matter of fact, I could use an assistant. You uh, want to make a little money? <laughs> as a plumber's helper? No way. Suit yourself. You know, the trouble with you is, Toby, you're never going to make it in this world because you've got no larceny in your soul. You think like an honest man, which is very unimaginative. I can think like a crook if I want. I just don't care to act like one. No, on the face of it, Toby and Iron seemed like opposites. But there must have been some mutual spark of recognition that first drew them together. The question was, who was going to convert... Whom? And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater. A new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Ransom, by Percy Granger. Our stars, Lureen Tuttle, Stephen Markle, and Vic Perrin. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. McVeigh had lived his whole life in the shadow of great wealth. He was a local tradesman in a Westchester community. Like most of us, he considered himself to be hardworking and honest. He took for granted that his life would never rise to any profoundly dramatic dimensions. He knew his place in the great scheme of things. And because he presumed to know himself so well, he took his envy of the rich in stride. He was naturally above temptation, so it hardly bothered him when he speculated, idly of course, on fantastic ways he might improve his lot. Mm, this is one hefty piece of real estate. It must be a quarter mile from the main road to the front of the house, let alone around the back. Yes? You, uh, Mr. Carson, the butler? I am. Toby McVeigh, the plumber. You, uh, called me? We did. Come in. Did you park your truck down the drive out of sight of the house, as we asked? Yep. Mm, sorry about that. Uh, Mr. DePalfrey seems to have an aversion to anything that reminds you we're living in the 20th century. <laughs> Don't we all, sometimes? Uh, this way. Well, these are some digs. She collects art, huh? Mm, they all do. Uh, the problem is in the basement uh, down here. Mm. You worked for the old dame long? Oh, only two months so far. Ah, that's a record. I hear she's not easy to work for, not since her husband died and left her all alone. It's her personal maid I feel sorry for. Mrs. DePorfrey has to sleep in the room next to hers. And every night at one o'clock, she gets her up to bring her a glass of warm milk. <laughs> Even the rich have trouble sleeping, eh? Well, the odd thing is Mrs. DePorfrey probably wouldn't wake up at all. So she sets her alarm to make sure she does. Like a ritual. Who knows? Well, here it is. A leaking pipe. 
Mm. As you can see, I tried to patch it myself without much success. Doesn't Mr. Tepalfrey have a regiment of handymen around to do that kind of thing? Well, now that she's alone, there's only me, a maid, and a cook. Hmm. Oh, I'll need to shut off the water. The valves are over here. Well, which part of the house is this going to affect? Well, the bathroom's on the second floor. Uh. The cook's room is on the top floor, and I have my quarters in another part of the basement here. Uh, you better tell the ladies the water will be out for almost a half hour. Mm, very well. It's uh, kind of hot down here. You mind if I crack a window? Be my guest. Just be sure to close it when you're finished. Mr. Carson? Ah, there you are. Oh, finished? Well, not exactly. I made a temporary patch for that pipe, but the whole section ought to be replaced. In fact, she could probably do with a whole new set of pipes. And those look like they arrive with the creation. You uh, want to clear that with the old babe? Oh, you just go ahead and order it. She'll take your word. I'll take a couple of days to order the pipe. I'll call you when it comes in. Uh, how much do we owe you for this visit? Um, $20. But you can pay me when I... Uh, Mrs. DePaulfrey likes to pay all her bills immediately. Another ritual. Ooh, well, there you go. That's uh, quite a wad she gives you to carry around. Plenty cash. <laughs> That's the whole order. And when will I get it? Okay, thanks. Hiya, Toby. Ah, oh, hello, Iron. You uh, managed to keep out of trouble today? Uh, I just ran three straight racks against some rich kid from the local prep school who thought he could hustle me. Your daddy probably bought him a pool table last month, and the kid thinks he's an expert. Guess where I've just been. Out of the DePaulfrey estate. Wow. I wonder how much that thing's worth. You know, it's a fact that most of the richest people in this country are women, widows, and stuff like that. Well, them's the breaks. What, uh, what you gonna charge her? Well, same as I'd charge anyone else. Oh, come on. Charge her double. She won't know the difference. I couldn't do that. Why not? Well, why should I? It isn't right. You know, Toby, that's your problem. And that's why you'll never get anywhere in this world. Yeah. Well, and what do you do? Except pass a few bad checks and get arrested every three months. <laughs> How much you make for that house call? $20. Oh, I made 200 hustling that kid. Well, I never said I was a hero. We just all got our own way of doing things, you know. You don't know yourself. Well, my way takes a certain amount of uh, initiative, that's all. I don't know. I did something kind of funny while I was there. Oh? Huh? What? I was, I was working in the basement, and I opened the window. So? But I didn't close it. When I finished, I left it open. You forgot? No. I left it open on purpose. Why? I don't know. But the other funny thing is, I told the butler I wanted to open it because I was hot, but I wasn't hot at all. So, what were you thinking? Nothing. I didn't have anything on my mind. So why did I do it? How well do we really know ourselves? what we are capable of, and what we might do in certain tempting situations? How often do we think one way and act another, as if our subconscious mind were saying, this is the real me? So, you didn't lock the basement window. Why not? I don't know. The butler told me something, see, but I didn't really think about it. Well, what did he tell you? Well... He said there were only three servants in the entire house. Oh, yeah? That's all? Anyway, I just did it. I guess it gives me a little buzz or something, just knowing that window's still open. Thanks for the tip, pal. Hey, Iron, no! Well, what, are you kidding me? It sounds perfect. She's a big uh, art collector, ain't she? The stuff in that house must be worth a mint. Well, what can you take out through a basement window, huh? Uh, plenty. But the butler knows who opened it. I'll be the first person the police come to, and if you think I'm taking a rest... Relax, rapid... Toby. It's very simple. After I enter, I shut the window, and when I leave, I go out the front door. I... Hey, you want to come along? Me? Two guys can carry twice as much loot as one. I'm not a thief. Well, who's going to know? I got fences that'll take the stuff off our hands for cold cash. Nah, I got a better plan. Yeah? Sure. Stealing art objects and silverware is no good. It's too bulky. It can be traced. So... What would you take? Mrs. DePalfrey. The old lady? Sure. You mean kidnap her? And hold her for ransom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is crazy. That's a major offense. Sure, but it pays top dollar. So, 
How would you do it? I was thinking about it on the way back to the shop. I worked out a whole plan. In the first place, there are no gardeners, no security people, and the front gate is broken and they leave it open. We can just drive right in. Hmm. There's a stand of trees just inside that I happened to notice as I was driving away. <laughs> we could park the car in there and no one would see it. You were figuring all this out? Now, there are only four people in the entire house, right? The butler sleeps in the basement, the cook sleeps on the top floor, the maid sleeps in the room next to Mrs. DePalfrey's on the second floor, so she's the only one we'd have to worry about. Ah, uh, but nobody gets away with kidnapping. I could. I take up to my cabin at Mohawk Mountain, and then I hit the family fast for the ransom while the shock of it still has them scared, and they don't want any trouble, no cops or anything, so they pay. I release the old lady, no one gets hurt. Now, that's pretty good, wise guy, except for one thing. What's your alibi? The cops are bound to question everybody who's been to the house recently. That's the best part of the whole plan. I have worked out a foolproof alibi. Carson told me that every night, Mrs. DePalfrey sets her alarm for 1 o'clock, rings for the maid, and has her bring her a glass of warm milk. Well, what'd she do that for? Who knows? The rich are different. So, anyway, I'd sneak into the house around midnight, see? Yeah. Go up to Mrs. DePalfrey's bedroom and shut off the alarm. Then I would take off. Without the old lady, I'd make the rounds of all the usual bars we hit at night. Get good and seen by everyone, then go back to the house a couple hours later, make off with the dame, and presto, the next morning the maid will tell the police the kidnapping must have happened before one because the old lady never woke her for her milk. And before one, you were on display at every bar in town, eh? Clever. That's not bad. For an amateur, not bad. So, you want to do it tonight? I was just putting you on. Well, it's a perfect plan. What can go wrong? Hey, don't try to involve me in this. You are a genius, Toby. You got the mind of a master criminal. I was just making a game. How but... much you figured the old lady's worth? Five, six million? What? We'd be set up for life. I wasn't serious. Yeah? So why'd you leave that basement window open? Hey, uh, Toby, another draft? Huh? T Toby. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, Pete. Yeah, anything wrong? You're, you're kind of quiet tonight. No. <laughs> kind of strange. I haven't seen Iron come in. Yeah? What of it? Well, nothing. I, I was just making an observation. Hey, there he is now. Hello, Pete. You want a draft, Iron? No, thanks, Pete. Not tonight. No beer? You must be on a something big. No, no. Uh, all right, give me a draft. You see, Toby, it's very important we make like everything's normal. Uh, here you go. Excuse me. <clears throat> well, what happened? Did you get in all right? Was the window still open? No problem. The alarm's turned off. So? So? So, you see how easy it is? I'm back safe and sound. Phase one completed. Now, are you in this with me? One million, maybe two, maybe more. Okay, let's do it. was precisely the problem. It was even easier than they thought. And now they are sitting in Toby's car at his cabin in the Connecticut hills, staring with open mouths at their hostage. Is she still breathing? Of course she is. Let's put the blindfold on her before she comes to, before we take her in. Yes. Yeah. There. 
It ought to be tight enough. Well, easy, easy. Don't cut off for circulation. Relax, will you? Oh. Huh. Uh-huh. He's coming around. Oh, yeah. I just thought of something. Names. We've got to have names for each other. You can't hear our real names. Uh, oh. Names. What? Uh, oh, I can't think of any. Uh, Mutt and Jeff, okay? Mutt and Jeff. Where am I? Oh. It ain't going to do any good to scream, lady. Oh. Oh, I was right. I've been kidnapped. Hey, Jeff, I just thought of something else. How much are we going to ask for? I don't know. A million. We'll make it two, huh? Have you taken me a long way from my home? Maybe. Maybe not. Oh, that's too bad. I could have saved you a lot of trouble. Yeah, sure. Lady, we want two million dollars ransom and don't try to tell us you're broke. No, no, that's what I was trying to say before you knocked me out. All my money's in my house. What? In fact, it's all in my bedroom. Your bedroom? Yes, seven million dollars in cash. Not ten feet from where I was sleeping. Why didn't you say so? I tried to. But you pushed that chloroform in my face. Well, what's the money doing there? I don't trust banks. My third and fifth husbands were bankers. That's the silliest thing I ever heard. Banks are perfectly safe. I certainly wouldn't try to rob one. Well, look, the fact is that's where it is. And now we've got to figure out how to get it. Well, it's all there. Seven million dollars. Unless you intend to kill me, please, you're welcome to some of it. Just where is it? I told you, in my bedroom. Where in your bedroom? Where? What do you do if I tell you? Oh, well, once we have the money, ma'am, we'll let you go. What assurances do I have of that? Hey, who's asking who for assurances? It's a two-way street. Why, I ought to... Mark, take it easy. Mark? Oh, oh, oh. don't tell me it's your partner's name, Jeff. Uh, yes, ma'am. That's what you can call it. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> I never thought I'd be kidnapped by Mark and Jeff. Well, in that case, I'm sure I can trust your word. The money is in the back of my closet. What's it in? Some kind of safe? No, plastic garbage bags. Plastic garbage bags? They're both things. Come on, let's get her inside and tie her up, and then we'll figure out how we're going to get to that cash. Do it? Oh. Oh, uh, how's the circulation, Mr. Uh, Palfrey? That rope isn't too tight, is it? Thank you. It's all right. Jeff. Okay. First question. Who do we contact? Who can we call to get us the money? I have no idea. Somebody in your family? Oh, I wouldn't bother with them. My children are ungrateful and incompetent. Besides, I'm not even sure where they're living. We never keep in touch. What about your butler, Mr. Carson? Oh, I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. He's been with me less than two months, and already things have started disappearing. In fact, I'm surprised he's not in all this. Well, there has to be someone we can call. A lawyer? Yes, well, his name is Richard Montgomery. But frankly, I don't see what he'll be able to do. Well, he isn't trustworthy either. Oh, no, he's perfectly honest. But, but that isn't the point. Once it's discovered that I've been kidnapped, there will be police all around my house. How could anyone smuggle out two million dollars in cash? Well, she's got a point. Must stop calling me mutt. Now look, you can't convince me everything you have is in them garbage bags. You must have some uh, stocks and bonds, huh? That could be converted to cash. Yes, I have a very healthy portfolio. But once they discover I'm gone, the district attorney will freeze all my assets. How do you know so much about all this? Oh, my dear man. Kidnapping is the occupational hazard of the rich. It's happened to so many of my best friends. Freezing assets so a ransom cannot be paid except under police surveillance is standard procedure. So what are we supposed to do? I don't know. But boys, believe me, I'm on your side. Anything I can do to help, please let me know. Uh, This is all very convenient for you, isn't it? You mean to tell me seven million in cash is sitting there in garbage bags and there's no way we can get at it? I'm sure you'll think of something, Mutt. Hey, I got an idea. Come into the other room. Maybe I can get back into the house. How? I'll tell the cops I'm the plumber. I'm doing a job. I need to check the pipes in the upstairs bathrooms to see if they need to be replaced, too. That'll get me into a room. 
If the money's really there, I can smuggle it out in my toolkit. Oh, a kidnapper goes back to the house to pick up his own ransom money? Who ever heard of such a thing? That's just it. Whoever did. It just might work, eh? Hold it there. Oh, hi. Are you uh, Captain Shriver? Yeah. Well, your man uh, down by the road said I should talk to you. I'm Toby McBay. I'm doing some plumbing work for Mr. DePalfrey. Oh, yeah. We've been looking for you. You have? Well, I've been out on calls all morning. What's going on here anyway? There's cops all over the place. Looks like the old lady may have been kidnapped last night. Kidnapped? Really? Hasn't been any contact yet for ransom money, but I expect that's coming soon enough. Well, I certainly hope Mrs. DePalfrey's all right. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions if I can. Sure. Mr. Carson says you were here yesterday, that right? Ah, I was I was working down in the basement. Mr. Carson? Yes, sir. Is this the man who was here yesterday morning? Oh, yes. For well, about a half hour. Yes, uh, Captain? Yes, yeah, Sergeant. We checked the whole house top to bottom. There's no clue how the kidnappers might have gotten in. Oh, just a minute, Captain. Mr. McVeigh, the window you opened in the basement, did you shut it when you left? You opened the window? Oh, yes, sir, but uh, I shut it. Sergeant? We checked the basement windows. They were all locked. Okay, it's all for now, Mr. McVeigh, but keep yourself available for further questioning. Oh, thanks, Captain. But, you see, I came here on the job. i got to take some measurements in the second-story bathroom for pipes that need replacing. Oh, I'm afraid that'll have to wait. Wait? Not letting anyone in the house until we get some kind of a break on the case. And well, why not? What possible difference could it make? It's a matter of procedure, Mr. McVeigh. But those pipes, they're pretty old. They really ought to be fixed. Why are you so anxious to get into the house? Me? I wouldn't worry about it. As long as Mrs. DePaulfrey is missing, she won't be using her bathroom, will she? But... Good day, Mr. McVeigh. Well, what happened? No luck. They wouldn't let me go inside. Why not? You know, the guy in charge of the investigation's a pill. Well, where the hell did that leave us? While you were gone, I called her lawyer. She was right. They've frozen her assets. Yeah. Our only chance is to get at that money in her bedroom. This is the most unbelievable situation I ever heard of. Oh, how's the old lady? Oh, she's fine. I'm the one that's a wreck. She talks constantly about horse shows and garden shows and dog shows. I tell you, I'm ready to strangle her, call it murder, and be done with it. Oh, you haven't done anything? No. No, I haven't. Uh, Mrs. Yes. DePoffrey. Oh, uh, you're back. I'm afraid I've been boring your partner here with all sorts of nonsensical prattle. But when one is blindfolded, it has an emetic effect on the tongue. Yeah, yeah, you see what I mean? She just don't stop. Iron, relax. Iron? Uh, uh, you, you idiot. Now she knows my name. No, I don't. No, I don't. No, no, no. I didn't hear a thing. I won't say anything. You don't have to kill me. Oh, this whole thing has been botched from the beginning. Now, I'm going to take over, and we're going to get some results. You, you're not going to get violent, are you? Games like her can always get their hands on dough in a pinch. I'm going to call that lawyer back. He sounded like a reasonable man. Oh, he is, and from a very good family. Shut up, you. Wow. I'm going to deal with him. We'll tell him we want two million dollars or else. Or else? You start sending parts of me to them? Toby, find a way to shut her up. I heard you. What? I didn't do a thing. I didn't. Now she knows my name, too. So? Well, that makes us even. But she knows who we are. If we let her go... Uh, that's right. So, what do you think, Toby? You were capable of kidnapping? You think you're capable of murder? What? Yes. My lips are sealed. Iron, come back into the other room. Oh, this is a real problem, huh? Yeah, and I don't like problems. We got no choice now. We'll have to kill her. No, relax. We'll get the money first. No, there was going to be no violence. We agreed on that. Well, the situation has changed. And we gotta improvise. All right, all right. But I got a better idea. Let's hear it. Okay, now, this is how I figure it. The only way we can get to her money is to get into the house. And the house is under constant police surveillance. Right. The only way to get into the house is to get rid of the cops. And the only way to get rid of the cops is to let Mrs. DePulfrey go. What? It's our best hope. Are you crazy? As soon as you let her go, she'll tell the cops our name. Not necessarily. Well, what's gonna stop her? Listen. Where are you going? back to enter into a little negotiation with our prisoner. Negotiation? You said I had the makings of a master criminal? Well, I'm about to prove to you how right you were.
Vincent Price again. And here's the concluding act of The Ransom. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You are saying that we ought to let the old dame go? She's the only one who can get us the money. Oh, now that's crazy. How are you going to get her to do it? Well, she'd have to give us her promise, of course. Promise? Toby, we kidnapped her. And now you're saying we should let her go if she promises to bring us the money? And not only that, she knows who we are. There's no way we can let her go. Well, there might be a way, you know, if the alternative is death. Well, of course, she'll agree to anything while we got her tied up in there. But once she's free, she'll go back on her word. I don't think so. You see, Iron, you got to understand who we're dealing with here. This is a person of class, refinement. She's also a sportswoman. And I happen to know by word of mouth that she's quite a poker player, too. Now, with someone like that, their word is their bond. It's a matter of pride. And if she'll give us a word, I'm willing to bet she'll keep it. Hmm. Just let me put the proposition to her in my own way and see what she says. Yes. Is that you? Yes. Well, what have you decided to do? <clears throat> well? I've already forgotten the name. Listen to her, listen to her. You see, she's lying right now. Ma'am, I've got a proposition to make to you. What? Well, we're all three in a kind of unusual situation here at the moment, aren't we? Yes. Well, the way I see it, it's a no-win proposition for all of us. On the one hand, we can't get your money as long as we hold you hostage... And on the other hand, even if we got the money, we couldn't let you go alive because you know our name. Yes, that's right, that's right. Now, your average kidnappers would probably panic, do you in, dispose of the body, and go on back about their daily business like nothing had happened. But you are lucky enough to have kidnappers who appreciate the shortcomings in that plan. We wouldn't be any richer, you'd be dead. So, my idea is very simple. Let's make a deal. What sort of a deal? We will let you go alive if you promise not to turn us in and to pay us the ransom at your earliest convenience. You let me go? Unharmed. Your life in exchange for the ransom. It's still your basic kidnapping principle. Um, let's put it this way, Mrs. DePalfrey. We're like two hostile nations facing each other with our respective fingers hovering over our respective big red panic buttons. So what I'm proposing we do is count to three and both take our fingers away at the same time. Uh, it involves a certain mutual trust, but this way we all come out ahead. The other way we don't. You say that's how you see it. What about your friend? He's ready to blow your head off. That's right. I see. Personally, I think my plan makes more sense. But how do you know I won't go to the police? Well, if you give us your word of honor, we're prepared to accept that. Oh, I'm orthodox. Plus, which? If you try any funny stuff, I got friends who'll do me a favor, even if I happen to be in jail. Oh, well, that rather takes the honor out of it, but I get the general idea. So, what do you say? Well, since the alternative is death, I uh, obviously agree. Good! But just one thing. I cannot, in good conscience, give you the full amount of the ransom you've asked for. After all, you're common criminals. No life, riffraff. Uh, hey, no, um, no, I most certainly cannot let this go without barter. On the other hand, I do put a certain value on my life. But consider for a moment. We are speaking of an exchange. And it stands to reason that the two items being exchanged should be of commensurate value. Now, if I were a young woman with a lion's share of my life in front of me, I might be willing to consider it worth the two million you ask for. But gentlemen, I am 86 years old. What am I getting for my ransom money? Three, maybe four good years at most. And the rest, devalued by senility. Therefore, I can't really see paying you anything more than a hundred thousand. A lousy hundred grand? Why, that's peanuts. It's a hundred thousand more than you had when you brought me oh, here. Oh, you are in no position to be making deals. Oh, but that's just it, Iron. She is. And a hundred thousand cold cash tax-free split two ways is an improvement over the scenery, as they say. Uh, I move we accept. No, no, no. no be no, reasonable. No. It's a princely sum for two days' work. What's the alternative? To become a murderer? And to come away empty-handed altogether? Think of your professional pride. When did you ever do something for nothing? Okay, okay. Good. Uh, Mrs. DePalfrey, with your indulgence, we'll leave the blindfold in place until we let you go. It'll make it easier for you to stick to your story that you can't identify it. Thank you. How considerate. <laughs> The 
us around the next bend. We'll uh, remove the blindfold if you can get out of the car with your eyes closed. Yes, I, I, I think so. Okay. Mutt, open the door. Yeah. And now, Mrs. DePalfrey, you're a free woman. Uh, once you're out of the car, open your eyes and walk straight ahead without looking back. Very well. You got your story straight? Yes. I was kidnapped and taken out on a boat into the sound. After several hours, they brought me back to shore and released me. I was blindfolded the entire time, and I never heard them speak a word. I saw and heard nothing that could identify them. And I have no idea why they let me go. I can only assume they got cold feet. Oh, the cops will think we're a couple of cowards. Oh, sticks and stones, not sticks and stones. Just remember, lady, any funny stuff and... Well... I'm pretty good at funny stuff, too. Yes, much. I'm sure you are. May I go now? Yes, ma'am. Bye, boys. Ten to one, she looks back. No, you lose, Iron. She's a woman of her word. There she goes, out of sight. I don't like it. Something's going to go wrong. Oh, I think it'll work out. Now... Let's get out of here before the police see her. Hey, Captain, look. Uh, that woman coming up the driveway. Isn't that Mrs. DePalfrey? Yeah, I think it is. Mrs. DePalfrey, you all right? Oh, in the peace office. Well, what happened? I was kidnapped. How'd you get free? Gentlemen, I have the most amazing stories to tell you. Something's gone wrong. I am relaxed. Well, look at the time. It's almost 2.30. The agreement was she'd be here in your shop at 2 o'clock sharp with the money. She'll be here. Oh, we really blew it. A couple of amateurs. That's what we are. Small-time penny ante creepos. If we were smart, we'd blow town. Just keep thinking of that $100,000, Iron. Let that be your anchor. You know what hurts most. When the full story of this ridiculous caper hits the streets, the guys ain't gonna believe it. I won't be able to show my face. I'll be a laughing stock. I don't think so, Anne. <laughs> Look who's coming through the door. Hello, boys. Ah, we made it last. You think she's been followed? Wait. Now, before either of you speak, let me guess which one of you is Mutt. And which one is Jeff. Well, that's not hard. The one with the teeth missing and the permanent scowl is obviously Mutt. Ah. And you, Mr. McBay, are Jeff. <laughs> are you alone? Entirely. I told the police the story we agreed on, and I stuck to it. In fact, if you're interested, here's the latest edition of the paper. It has the entire story. Wealthy widow's abduction of mystery. At this very moment, the police are down at the marina, checking out everyone who owns the boat. Well, it looks as if you've kept to our bargain. So, where's the money? Well, now, that's what we have to talk about. I thought it over, and I really don't see how I can honor... That part of our bargain. What do you mean? I'm a woman of my word, it's true. But I was forced to make that deal under duress. And I think that excuses me for my obligation, don't you? Anyway, I've decided not to give you a cent. You told the cop... No, 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 that much of the bargain not kept. What I'm saying is, I'm prepared to forget the whole business. Well, gentlemen... Uh, just a minute, just a minute. You're not going anywhere. You think you can double-cross us like that and get away with it? Maybe you didn't think I was serious, but I got a gun here. And I'm going to blow those last three or four years right out of your spindly frame. I know. Oh, oh, let him go ahead, Mr. McVeigh. As a matter of fact, if you want the money I promised you, this is the one way you'll get it. But, what do you mean? I was quite certain Iron was serious about doing me in if I didn't give you the money. And I didn't fancy the notion of spending my last few remaining years looking over my shoulder. So, before I came here, I took a certain precaution. I went by an insurance office and took out a life insurance policy for a hundred thousand dollars. Payable to the two of you. Iron Smith and Toby McVeigh. Uh, to us? Yes. But uh, there was one stipulation. 
The policy is only good if I die by violent means. So, <laughs> go ahead, Iron. Fire away and the money is yours. But there will be some very awkward questions, gentlemen. Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. The Ransom was written by Percy Granger, produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Lurene Tuttle, Stephen Markle, and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Jack Carroll, Barney Phillips, and Don Diamond. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Entertainment with great music and more. People like Lori Allen and Jim Doyle on KMOX FM, St. Louis. KMOX FM. President Carter says the nation cannot reach its energy goals if Congress fails to pass a windfall profits tax on the oil industry. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. The president held a news conference at the White House tonight saying he needs the help of the American people in getting the tax approved. Noting the House has already passed it, the president referred to what happens next. Now it is the turn of the United States Senate to act. And there will be a massive struggle to gut the windfall profit tax bill. If this happens, then we cannot reach our energy goals. I want to serve notice tonight that I will do everything in my power as president to see that the windfall profit tax is passed because I consider it to be crucial to our nation's future. Referring to last week's changes in his cabinet, the president said, I have no apology to make. He said he felt changes were needed to create a new team for him. Mr. Carter said the appointment of Hamilton Jordan as White House Chief of Staff was one of the most grossly distorted decisions he's ever made in his political career. The president explained what Jordan is and is not to be. He will not be the chief of the cabinet. I will be chief of the cabinet. He will not be the chief of the Congress. The Congress is an independent body. We'll have the same relationship with the Congress with the same people that we have all the time. Hamilton Jordan will be chief of the White House staff. That's his responsibility assigned by me. That's a job he will fulfill, and I have absolutely no doubt, based on his past experience and my knowledge of him, that he will do a superb job. The president also said he's made no decision on running for re-election next year. House leaders tonight abruptly halted debate on a new standby gasoline rationing bill. The halt came after the unexpected adoption of an amendment sharply limiting the president's flexibility to impose rationing. The amendment would give Congress two chances to reject any rationing plan, first when he drafts it and then when he tries to implement it. House leaders will try again to pass a rationing bill without the Republican-sponsored amendment. At his news conference tonight, President Carter referred to the rationing development, saying, This action today by the House illustrates the timidity of Congress in dealing with a sensitive political issue. Democratic Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, a key figure in the debate on the SALT II Treaty, said today he cannot support the arms agreement without a pledge from President Carter for major increases in military spending. Nunn said the administration is not spending enough on military preparedness. The administration's budget for the past two years and the president's defense budget projection through fiscal year 1984, together with the Secretary of Defense's own testimony, make it abundantly clear that the Carter administration is not yet prepared to compete effectively with the Soviet Union in the military arena. And the Joint Chiefs have said clearly that effective competition is necessary if SALT is to have any meaning for our nation. None is regarded as a serious student of military affairs, and his position on SALT could influence how some of his colleagues vote. In Boston tonight, a former city employee was shot, uh, who shot and wounded a high-ranking police officer surrendered to police. 36-year-old David Sundstrom gave himself up after holding six members of his family hostage for several hours. The Junta, now in control of Nicaragua,